Ever wonder why you worked so hard to avoid the lasagna at dinner, only to give in to your craving for not one but two helpings of cake for dessert? Well, new research may hold some answers to this vexing question. A new study in the Journal of Consumer Psychology confirms what we've been know- what we've known for some time, and that is, each of us has an internal reservoir of self-control. We have a reservoir of self-control that. It depletes every time we resist a temptation. We use a little bit of of it up. But for the first time, researchers have taken pictures of the brain to show what was happening when a person exerts and then loses self-control. Dr. William Hedgecock was a co-author of the study. He is a neuroscientist and assistant professor of marketing at the University of Iowa. He joins us from Denver. Welcome to Science Friday. Oh, thanks for having me. You know, first, let me back up a bit, because I think it would, it would be surprising to most people to learn that we actually have a reservoir of self-control. Uh, sure. So this is a, a theory called regulatory resource depletion. Uh, and le- like you said, when people exert self-control, what we see is people have a hard time exerting self-control later. Uh, so this I- idea of one resource may be, um, you know, not intuitive uh, but I think most of us have had this sort of experience where you exert self-control at one point and then end up succumbing to temptation later. Mm-hmm. And where is that center of self-control? Well, what we're finding is uh, that the center seems to be the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. So it's an area that's uh, sort of near the temple uh, and, and underneath the temple of your head. Hmm. And, and how do we know that that's where it is? Well, so we ran an fMRI study where we had subjects come into the scanner uh, they first exerted self-control, and we saw them uh, having activation in areas like the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and the anterior cingulate cortex. And this is what you know, we would have expected. Then we had them exert self-control later on a subsequent task, and we saw less activity in this dorsolateral prefrontal cortex area. So, so it had been depleted, and some of their self-control was gone. Yeah. So we saw behaviorally that they had less self-control, and that seemed to be correlated with the fact that they had less activity in that area. Now, is, is, it, is the reservoir a, a reservoir of chemicals? Is it a reservoir of neurons? What, what is exactly is the reservoir? So uh, we don't really know that yet. Uh, we do know that there's less activity in that area. Uh, it seems unlikely that it's a, a neurotransmitter, for instance, but uh, we, we would need some follow-up studies to find out exactly why is it less active there. Mm-hmm. And what kind of test do you do when you test people for their self-control? Do you put pie in front of them and say, <laughs> you can only have one bite or what? Uh, well, that's certainly, some people do that. So we'll yeah. put people in front of uh, brownies or something uh, and then see later would they uh, like to choose brownies versus a healthy snack or, or uh, also we test them on things like will they perform well on a cognitive task um, but uh, in the scanner, we couldn't do that. It's, it's difficult to, you know, put a pie next to a person in, in the scanner. <laughs> so what we did was something a little bit more sterile than that. We had them look at a fixation point on a screen, and we flashed words underneath the, the fixation. And the words would move around, uh, and, but they were very close uh, to the fixation. We told subjects to ignore them uh, and definitely not read them. Uh, but this was difficult or, for the most part, impossible for subjects to do. So it required uh, self-control on their part to uh, to not read the words. Don't don't think of pink elephants. Uh, yeah, well, so that's another version of uh, or another way to manipulate self-control. You could have them not think about elephants, uh, which is difficult to do once we mention it to you. All right, one eight hundred nine eight nine eight two five five. Talking with Dr. William Hitchcock. Uh, about exerting self-control, and so can can you actually tell at the moment uh, by looking at the scan when uh oh they've lost their self-control? Uh, well, what we saw was uh, sort of a gradual depletion over time. Yeah, uh, we didn't see a, a particular time frame. And and by the way, our, our subjects sometimes were able to exert self-control later. It's it's not like they completely lost it. They were just less able. They just uh, occasionally would su- succumb to temptation uh, more frequently than when they were not depleted. Mm-hmm. Let's see if we can get a phone call in here from Bill in Loma Linda, California. Hi, Bill. Hi there. Thank you for taking my call. I love your show. Thank you. Um, I'm really interested in this subject, neuroscience and uh, self-control, and you guys, um, it's fascinating. I was wondering just if your, if your guest speaker had any 
idea uh, or any speculation on how we can maybe improve self-control or modulate the self-control, um, you know, maybe modeling it in an animal study and then uh, improving self-control. Yeah, because because uh, you're gonna you're, you're gonna bet I'm I'm sure. And let me ask Dr. Hitchcock about this: that the pharmaceutical companies would be very interested in a, in a pill, right? To continue. Uh, well, I think the pharmaceutical you know companies and and also you know just people or policymakers in general. Um, you know, we just ran a quick behavioral experiment to see what would happen, and, and it, it seems pretty simple. But what we had people do was think about ways they would actually uh, execute control. So uh, we went to a gymnasium. Uh, we had people coming out who had this sort of fitness goal or, or eating healthy goal, and we would just have them think about ways uh, that they would execute that. So come to the gym three times a week or, you know, eat healthy and not versus unhealthy foods, and that would slightly improve it. We don't think that, we don't think that it replenished the resource, so to speak, but it was sort of a crutch. It would just make it easier to exert control. Um, but as you mentioned, this idea of pharmacological uh, interventions. Uh, it's you know it's too too early to tell exactly what would be useful, but this, these brain images provide us at least with some direction on on where we should look. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you do you know how it's replenished? Did you image participants' brains after a period of time to find out? So no, we didn't do that. It, it would seem to take a while. Uh, right now, all we know that will help you is to take a break. So just do something that doesn't require self control. You know, if you take a nap. Uh, or if you're somewhere where it's easy to exert self-control so that you don't sort of tire it out, uh, it mm. seems that people are able to replenish it that way. I guess it's sort of like the, the, what people tell you if, you know, take yourself out of that situation that's giving you a loss of self-control. Yeah, that's correct. And, and not only will it help you right there at that situation, but it might help you later when you're trying to exert self-control uh, in, a, in a later time where it's harder to avoid temptation. So, so have you found that you can practice self-control? So uh, I have not personally run that study, but we do know uh, other researchers have looked at that and found that if you practice self-control, uh, it, you're able actually to strengthen this or, or improve your resource so that you'll have... Uh, Mm-hmm. Um, a better ability to not wear out over time. It's like the muscle theory, right? If you're using muscle over and over again, you strengthen it. Yeah, it, at least in these two ways, this sort of uh, muscle analogy seems to uh, seems to fit with uh, how your regulatory uh, resources mm-hmm. work. Let's go to Austin in Sandpoint, Alaska. Hi, Austin. Hey, hey thanks there. for taking my call. You're welcome. Go hey, ahead. Hey, I had... I, um, I study theology as a pastor, and I was curious, did you notice anything like um, correlations between people with religious convictions and increased self-control or decreased self-control or anything like that? Uh, You know, I'm I'm sorry to say we did not end up looking at that. That's an interesting question. Um, Things like, um, you know, religiosity or uh, personality traits or gender. Uh, Honestly, the things that we've looked at uh, when we have looked at those, uh, they don't tend to be a very big predictor, uh, but, but I haven't specifically looked at religion. All right. Thanks for calling, Austin. Uh, can you, if you look at an image of a brain, of a brain scan of somebody, can you tell from looking at the scan how much self-control they have or have, how much reservoir they have left? Uh, no. So we can't do that. I'm sure people would be interested. Um, you know, just because an area of the brain is bigger, it does not necessarily mean that it would be, you know, more, uh, you know, stronger, let's say. So uh, a large DLPFC or, or small, it, it, it doesn't tell us if people are better able at, at exerting self-control. I suppose the only maybe uh, exception to that would be if someone has uh, brain damage to an area. So, so particularly taking out that area, uh, then you might uh, be able to predict that they'd be very bad at self-control. We have a tweet from uh, Kay McKenzie who says, I wonder if this could help alcoholics and the like to resist temptation. Uh, so things like alcoholism are a little bit different, um, but, but certainly with the idea of, of uh, when they are trying to uh, resist temptation, that this could help them out. This is Science Friday from NPR. I'm Ira Flato talking with Dr. William Hitchcock, author, co-author of a study about uh, self-control. Uh, let's see if we can... Uh, get to another phone call or two. But, but before I get to that, in the second part of your study, you looked at ways to intervene and make people aware of the consequences 
of the choices that they were making? Were they less likely to lose self-control with this kind of intervention if they knew the consequences? Uh, So if we had them think about consequences, uh, it did not seem to help them too much. Uh, On the other hand, if we had them think about ways that they would actually execute control, uh, it did help them. And and in particular, we had them uh, choosing from tempting versus, you know, healthy snacks, and we saw that their snack behavior would change if they thought about uh, ways that they could uh, make better decisions. Mm -hmm. Did you try to distract them at all and see if that would bring self-control a little bit back? Uh, no, so we did, we did not look at uh, distracting them later. Uh, often we would use a distraction sort of thing to, uh, to diminish their ability to exert self-control. Mm-hmm. Go to the phones to Jamie in Cleveland. Hi, Jamie. Hi, thank Hi you there. for taking my call. You're welcome. Uh, I remember hearing an article on NPR once uh, that, about a study doing, done with dieters, and they had people think about uh, very specifically eating M&Ms and the crunching and the taste and the swallowing. And then afterwards, the control group that was not told to think about eating M&Ms had way fewer, ate way more M&Ms than the people who thought about it. And I was just wondering uh, what you think uh, the self-control and if we can trick our brain into having more self-control by thinking, by making it think we've already given in. Good sure. Question. Actually, I believe um, if, if I'm thinking of the same study you're talking about, I, I believe what they're doing is satiating people. So basically, if you're imagining... Uh, eating, you know, M&M after M&M, eventually, even though you're just thinking about it, uh, it can make you start to think that you're getting tired of eating them. Uh, So this sort of, um, uh, you know, perceptual satiation is happening. So, uh, you know, if you have them, for instance, eat just two or three, it might actually make them more, um, make it harder to resist temptation. But after eating 30 or 40, they start to think, well, I I don't find these very appetizing anymore. I'd I'd prefer not to eat them. Uh, So it's definitely possible uh, just sort of mentally to to convince yourself to eat more or less uh, that way. Mm-hmm. Let me see if I can get one more question from Molly in Washington, D.C. Hi, Molly. Hi, guys. Thanks for taking my call. Mm-hmm. So I read a book last year called Willpower exactly on this topic, and its central premise was that you can improve that that depleted resource of willpower, self-control, as we're calling it in this study here, through glucose, and I was wondering if the author could talk about that. They, they proved, in my mind, pretty positively that uh, a regular intake of glucose, not necessarily super sugary sub- uh, substance, um, but that, that base, um, I guess, willpower generator could really improve your, your discipline. All right, let's get an answer. Thanks for the question. Sure. So I believe that that book and the study uh, was someone named Roy Baumeister. Excuse me, Roy Baumeister did that research, uh, and they have found that if you have people drink a sugary substance, it can end up increasing uh, people's self-control. Um, our study does not directly address that. Uh, I guess our results are consistent with that in that we see less activation in the brain, uh, and and that could hypothetically be from uh, la- lack of glucose. Uh, but at this point, all we can say is that there's just less activity in that part, uh, and we, we don't know why. As, a, as a, an assistant professor of marketing, do you think that marketing people would love to, to convince you how to lose self-control and go out and buy their product? Yeah, so it, uh, it, it's certainly possible. That's, that's one way that marketers could use this information. Actually, there's, there's just as many marketers who would like to improve your self-control. Uh, so you could think about, you know, fitness clubs or mm. or diet companies uh, or, you know, particularly uh, finance companies or retirement savings. Uh, you know, they can only make money if if you actually do exert self-control, and, and uh, we hope they'd find it useful to figure out how to improve that. Dr. Hitchcock, thank you very much for taking time to be with us. Well, thanks for having me. Have a good weekend. William Hedgecock, neuroscientist and persi- assistant professor of marketing at the University of Iowa, also co-author of a study in the Journal of Consumer Psychology.